I want to start out by saying that I, I love you. It's such a privilege, not just to be your pastor, because some of you I'm not your pastor, but it's just such a privilege to know you and to, and to know your hearts, to see what God is doing in your hearts around the world. Some of the comments that I get from people that are watching online, it's so exciting to, to understand that people, that some of them I've never seen, don't know. I mean, I've become, I'm good, you know, getting to know them online, but people that are watching things and being encouraged, and, and for you, how God has used you, and the privilege that I have of, of where I live here, just of being around you guys. You guys are, are so beyond special, and uh, I just want to tell you that I love you. Well, I've got a title, and it's simple. For unto you is born. You know, there was somebody born unto us. I just want to share a few things. I was doing some reading, and a lot of times when I'm reading, I'll write stuff down, just notes kind of to myself, and, and then I'll <coughs> go back and see what I've written, and I'll say, boy, that's exactly what I wanted to share. And I want to read some things that, that I've kind of gleaned from other places and, and kind of put together. But in this time that we're in right now, in our world, the way it is, the way it is in Pakistan, the way it is in Iran, the way it is in Iraq, the way it is all over the world, it looks like things are out of control, but they're not. In this great turmoil that's going on on earth, we can know this. Every detail of your life and my life is in control of somebody, but not you. But the good news is, if it was you, you would be in a mess. But God is in control. Some people think that just chance, just mere chance, governs the world. That things just happen. But because of the world's fallen state, it looks like that, but I can promise you that is not the case. The world is not governed by chance. Romans 8, 28, you know that verse. The Bible says, For God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called by His name. Know this, you've been called by His name. Even if you don't love Him, here's the good news, He loves you. He loves you. So God is in control. Two things, I've said this over and over, and this may be the kind of the theme of my life, hopefully for the rest of my life, I want to share this. Now whether I always walk in this is another story, but this is what I believe. Are you ready for this? God knows and God cares. I don't care what's going on, He knows and He cares. And God's knowledge is bigger than our knowledge. It's bigger than in every way. In the world, that we live in, even our little area, you, you people live in Pakistan, we live in the United States and in Georgia in the United States. And there are people I know that live in California that are watching in New York and Michigan and a lot of people in Canada that I've grown to love very much and in Latin America and Colombia and Argentina. It's just so exciting. In Lima, Peru, these folks that we love, they're like they're one of us, even though we're not close, but wherever your world is, wherever your part of the universe is, I want you to know that God is in control. It may look bad. Things are happening. Bad things in the streets. Danger. But God is in control. We need to know this. Sometimes we think that we have to know what's going on. Do you know if you put all the knowledge, all the knowledge of all men, that are presently alive on the earth and that have ever lived, if you put all the knowledge of all men of all time in one person or in one spot, it would only be the tiniest tip of the largest iceberg compared to what God knows. You couldn't know it. We need eternity for God to reveal to us how great He is and how much He loves us. We need to know He is constantly working on our behalf. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're saved or lost. God is constantly working on your behalf. You say, you mean to say that God is working on behalf of the lost? <laughs> well, yeah. He uh, sent His Son to die instead of you. He is constantly working on your behalf we will see how wonderfully caring that God is. You're going to see how that God cares for you. This is why we must, I want to say this, we must live by faith and not by sight. We must live as an everyday, ongoing experience 
Trusting Him. Faith. Now, some places I go, they talk about faith. And when I'm in Latin America a lot, they talk about faith. Faith, 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 faith. But here's what they do. They're putting their faith in having faith. We don't put our faith in faith. We don't believe in believing. We believe in Jesus. We put our faith in Christ, in the fact that He knows and that He cares, and that He cares so much in the fact that He literally became a man. He was born of a virgin some 2,000 years ago. He was born in a stable, and He was laid in a manger. That means feeding trough. He was laid in a feeding trough wrapped in just rags that they could find. Why? Because it didn't matter. Wherever he is, it's the right place. He was a king born into poverty. Some people teach and preach that if you're a Christian, you're always going to be wealthy and you're always going to be healthy. And yet, some of the strongest Christians I've ever known are not wealthy at all. And some of them aren't healthy. God loves you and God is in control. What's the worst thing that could happen to any of us on this earth? The worst thing we can think of is that we could die. Well, the fact is, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. The world has no weapons against you, if you understand this. No weapons. Now, the world that we live in is the same troubled world that they lived in some 2,000 years ago. I'm going to read, I'm really not going to do much commenting, but I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 9. Then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 2, but I'm just going to read the first seven verses. And this is a this is a prophecy, the world's greatest prophecy, of the coming Messiah. There were 130 or more prophecies of Christ. Every one of them were fulfilled. Every one of them. The odds of all the prophecies of the coming Christ being fulfilled exactly like they were prophesied are so big. You could start, you could start here and... and, and putting numbers out and that number would grow larger and larger and larger and larger and literally run for miles. It is such a large number that our minds won't even understand it. The, the, the percentage that every prophecy would be prophesied and be fulfilled. Exactly. You would be, it would be 100 times 130 times 130 times 130 times 130 times 130. It's a really big number and yet that's to one and yet that's exactly what happened. In verse 1 in Isaiah 9, But there will be no more gloom. I like that, don't you? Now this was written before it happened. But as far as God is concerned, it, was, it had already happened before He created the universe. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He, he treated me, land of Zebulon, and the land of Naphtali, with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee, and of the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness. Now look at that. The people who walk in darkness. Where do people walk in darkness? All over the world. It says, we'll see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Now notice this. Who shines on who? The light shines on who? Those who live in a dark land. Let me ask you this question. What did the people living in darkness have to do with the light shining on them? Nothing. Nothing. It was all the light. Who is the light? Jesus said He is the light. He is the light of men. He says in verse 3, You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence. That hasn't happened a lot of places, but it's going to. He says also, as with the gladness of the harvest. You know how people are excited at harvest time? You remember when Nancy was really sick, Darwin, and you got the, the email from a man that, that loved you and loved Nancy, and he said, the Lord knows you need to be out there harvesting. God's just going to have to heal Nancy. People get excited in the harvest. They do. I'm going to tell you, in Pakistan, here, there's a great harvest of men and women that we're going to see that God loves. They're going to come to a knowledge of Him. Now, God loves those that never come to a knowledge of Him. But God loves those that do also. He says, as men rejoice with the, uh, when they divide the spoil. What does that mean, divide the spoil? Here's what I think that means. Because of His birth, 
because of his life, because of his death, and because of his burial, and because of his resurrection. Here's the spoil. All, all that was his is given to me, and it was given to you. The spoil is the spoil of the victor. Who is the victor? I am victorious. You are victorious because of what Christ has done. We divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and staff on their shoulders. Do you know what the, the yoke of the burden of the staff and, uh, and the yoke of the burden? You know what I think that is? I think that's the law. Christians have been bound by the law. Christians are putting these rules on people that were never meant for you. They were never meant for you. The Jews were given the law. Why? Because they needed to know that they could not keep the law, that they needed Jesus. They needed a Savior. Gentiles were never given the law. Never. Now you say, why are they under it now? Don't know. I can tell you this, that trying to keep the law has never brought light to anybody. All it's ever done is shown your great defeat. But Jesus did keep the law. He is the law keeper. Because He did, we don't need to. We walk not under the law, but we walk in grace. We walk in the life of Christ Jesus as He lives His life through us. He said, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. Now, you know what's really sad? I think that a lot of times religious leaders are the ones that are putting this burden on people. Rather than telling them about the one who has relieved the burden, they're putting the burden on people. For every boot, verse 5, of the booted warrior in the battle torment and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. We won't need our weapons of war anymore under Jesus. Now that day's not come, but that day's going to come, just as sure as the first time when He came. Verse 6, and this is where we all know these verses. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. You know, it just doesn't say for us right there. He will be given to us. And the government will rest on His shoulders. Aren't you glad? A righteous man heading up the government? <coughs> it won't be like corrupt leaders that we see around the world now. This is the way it really is. In His name will be called Wonderful. I used to think that a uh, wonderful counselor and I used to think that all these names here were kind of talking about one thing, but it's separate things. Wonderful Counselor. He's going to be the Mighty God. And I've had time I'd go into all this, but I don't. He's going to be the Eternal Father. Do you know that Jesus and the Father are one? Some people have said, and mistakenly so, that if you want to know what the Father's like, study the law. And I hear that, and I just cringe, and I say, what? Where does it say that in the Bible? Well, let me give you a hint. It doesn't. Jesus said, if you want to know what the Father's like, what did He say? He said, look at me. If you want to know what the Father's like, look at Jesus. He loves you just like Jesus does. The Father's not the bad guy pouring out the punishment, and Jesus is the good guy trying to, trying to ward it off. God the Father and God the Son are one. Separate beings, yet different, different personalities, and yet one. I don't understand that, but they are. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. I said two weeks ago that peace is not a position. Peace is not a, a situation. Peace is a person. I'm at peace because the ruler, prince of peace, has given me his peace. His peace is mine. A peace that is in him. Peace is a person. His name is Jesus. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace. In the beginning, His name, and it still is, Yahweh, I Am. The same I Am that met with Adam and Eve in the garden. The same I Am that, that literally met with Moses at the burning bush. The same I Am that walked with Jacob and wrestled with Jacob. The same I Am that changed Abram's name to Abraham when he met with him. The same I Am Jesus said He was that I Am. He said before Abraham was born, I Am. The same I Am that was involved in creation from before there was a beginning is the same I Am who was born of a virgin some 2,000 years ago. 
And it says, On the throne of David and over his kingdom, the government of peace will be on him, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Okay. I was talking about some of the prophecies. If you'll turn back over to Matthew chapter 2. Let me just read down to verse 6. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Why was all Jerusalem troubled along with Herod? Because when the wicked king Herod was troubled, they were too. Because believe me, he made trouble for them. In verse 4, Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Verse 6, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Let me stop right there. We'll come back in a minute. We know some things. First of all, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem, Rahil, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. House of bread. When you're baking, you know, for some ways, you, you're, everything comes around the flour or the meal to do the baking. Bread was the necessity of life. Jesus said, what did he say? He said, I am the bread of life. Jesus claimed to be that. Interesting, he was born in the city that means house of bread. So you can say this, the word Bethlehem could be loosely translated the house of Jesus. Bethlehem, where much is grown in Israel. It's a place where a lot is grown. And Jesus called himself the bread of life. And, and David was born near there. The city of David is only a few miles from Bethlehem. We would call it almost the same town. There's just a little bit of distance between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. I told you before there were 130 prophecies concerning Jesus' birth in the Old Testament. And all of them were fulfilled. Let me just give you a few. In Micah 5.2, which is what we just read, Micah 5.2 is the same verse as Matthew 2, 6. Micah 5, 2 said that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Now you think that's just a coincidence. It just happened. I don't think so. You see, they weren't living in Bethlehem. They were living in Nazareth. And they had to go down there because they, uh, they had, Caesar had decreed that they would go to their city of birth for tax. And so you know the story. Joseph took Mary, who was his espoused wife, that means they had not consummated the marriage. They would say, we would say today they are engaged, but she was already pregnant. Why was she pregnant? She was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and the Savior, Jesus, was going to be born of a virgin. The Bible says they fled to Egypt, Hosea 11.1. 1. It says, out of Egypt I called my firstborn. That's exactly what happened. After he was born, the Magi came, we're going to see this, and... Herod was looking for the, all the babies under two. He was going to kill them all, and he did. And so the angel came to Joseph and said, Go to Egypt now. And he went from Bethlehem to Egypt. Just a coincidence. The Bible talks about Rama. It says, Rachel weeps. This is in Jeremiah 31, 15. All over Judea, mothers and fathers were weeping. Why? Because their, their young children were being killed. And it says in Isaiah... 53.3, it shall, he shall be called a Nazarene because they went back to Nazareth. These are just a few, but there are so many more. From Bethlehem will come a ruler shepherd. He says in verse 6, he's going to shepherd my people. Let me talk about Herod a minute. Herod was a really wicked man. He was the antithesis of Jesus, the opposite. Herod was a great warrior. We're going to see some things about him, but, but he was not a good guy. But Jesus is God. He is fully God, and yet He's fully man. And the Bible talks about Him being a shepherd. The word shepherd, it means to feed or to tend a flock or to keep sheep or to rule or to govern. And I'm going to give you the purposes of a shepherd. This should also be the purpose of rulers. The purpose of a ruler. Now you tell me if this is the kind of rulers that we have now. It means one of the jobs of the ruler is to furnish pasture, pasture land. And uh, 
This, this is a permanent thing. It's a present and it's a future thing, but it's permanent. God has given us pasture land. What is pasture? In the Bible, in, in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 23, it talks about pasture. It's where there is safety and security, there is food, and there is water in a pasture land. And he talks about the, uh, the, one of the things the shepherd does is to nourish. And it means to feed nursing, you know, animals. Like with nursing babes. Who feeds a nursing babe? The mama. You know, not only is God the father, but he also is the mother. You know, we have the idea. Now, this, this is going to get some, maybe me in trouble. If it does, it does. Some people have the idea that God the Father is some old guy with long hair and a long white beard. And yet the Bible says that God is neither male nor female. He's spirit. Now Jesus was male. Now he became man. But God encompasses all that's, that's of a father, because he is the father, but he also nourishes and nurses like a mother and loves like a mother. I'm not saying God's a woman. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, that the attributes that uh, are attributed to a father and a mother are both found in God the Father. He nurses and he nourishes spiritual babes. And the, the, the shepherd will cherish one's body. You know what a shepherd does with his sheep? He cherishes every sheep, every one. You know the story about the hundred sheep, one was lost. And the Bible says the good shepherd left the ninety-nine and searched for the one. And when he found the one, he threw a party. God's always throwing parties. Down on this earth, we're always trying to stop parties. But God's always throwing parties. And He called all His friends together and He rejoiced because the sheep that was lost has been found. I'm going to tell you, everybody on this earth is loved by God. Everybody on this earth is cared for by God. And when one is found, I don't understand all this, but I'm going to tell you the Bible said the angels in heaven rejoice. I believe heaven is going to be one big party place. There's going to be rejoicing going on all the time. All the time. And another thing that the shepherd does, and there's so many more, but he protects. He protects. The Bible said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And he's not talking about the same kind of rod and staff. The burden that was placed on the people over in Isaiah chapter 9. He's talking about the rod that the shepherd uses to ward off evildoers. To beat off the lions. To beat off the would-be attackers, the wolves. That's what God does. And the staff is to gently pull the shepherd. I mean pull, pull the shepherd. Gently pull the sheep back into the fold. God does that. He does that. But in verse 1, we talk about the days of Herod. Let's give you a little bit about Herod. Herod was not a Jew. He was not a Jew, but he was over the Jews. Herod had been a great warrior. He'd been appointed by Rome. And Herod was a city builder. Herod built so many great things. He truly was a, a great clinician, if you will, of government. He knew how to govern. Now, it wasn't always good, but he had ideas and he could make them come to pass. You've heard of the place in Israel called uh, Masada. You know, Herod built that. It's still a marvel to this day. He was a city builder. He built stronghold. Uh, but he was ruthless. He didn't mind killing a whole generation. You know, if you kill all the male children under two, you realize you're talking about a whole generation of men were killed off in about 0 B.C. Or minus, or I'm sorry, 3 B.C. Some people think Jesus was born on 0 A.D., but he was actually born a little bit before they... He came before the time got straightened out, in other words. But there was a whole generation of people that were killed. He was wicked, and he was ruthless. And when he was, when he was established king, let me tell you what he did. He killed, he killed all of his family. He killed his, his mother, his wife, his sons, his brother-in-law. He didn't want anybody laying claim to his throne. He killed everybody that was related to him. What a wicked man Herod was. And when he died, you know that he had it fixed so that the distinguished citizens would be killed when he died so that he knew that there would be mourning at his death. He killed all the male children under the age of two. This was a wicked man. But I'm going to tell you this. In spite of all of that, God was in control. 
You say, how could God be in control over such turmoil? I'm just going to tell you He was. I'm going to tell you about these children that He killed. You know where they are? Every one of them? They're in heaven with Him. There was no loss for them. There were loss for those that loved Him. I mean, loved them, but God was still in control even over that. Well, in verse 1 and 2, we see the story of the Magi. And some people, you know, they call them kings. And possibly they were. You've heard the song, We Three Kings. Uh, and, and probably they were. But these men, these magi, came from present day Iran and Iraq. Now I'm going to tell you why they came from there. That is the <coughs> land of Daniel. Last week I spoke on Daniel. Daniel's teachings and Daniel's life that spread throughout that whole area that huge area that at the time ruled the world, his teachings and his message of grace were still impacting the people of that area. These three magi, these three kings, wealthy men, these three guys had been searching the scriptures looking for the coming of the Messiah. And sure enough, they knew when it was time. The Magi. This name is given to them by the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Medes and the Persians, if you will. And it literally means wise men, teachers, priests, physicians, astrologers, seers, interpreter of dreams, soothsayers, sorcerers. In other words, anybody that had anything to do with, with wisdom were given the name Magi. Now, these Oriental men who, who discovered the star... That was, that was coming, representing the Messiah being born and coming to Jerusalem. We're going to see about this star in a minute. But these guys were looking. They were looking at all the signs and they were seeing one by one they were being, they were, they were happening. By the way, that's the same thing we should be looking at today. I believe that there are signs going on in the Middle East and around the world, in Europe and in the U.S. But in those areas primarily, we can see the signs are coming to be for the return of the Messiah. I believe He's going to come back again. Well, these men were wise and they discovered this rising star. And here they go. Now this word, Magi, what does that sound like when, when you hear Magi? What word does that sound like? Magic. magic. Do you know that's the word we get the word magic from? That is the word. These men were strongly influenced by Daniel's writings. And you know what? Because of that, we're strongly influenced now by these men and by Daniel's writings. Well, don't underestimate. This is for you in Pakistan, and this is for you wherever you are. Do not underestimate. Do not underestimate the life of a man that's trusting in Christ. That man's life, or that woman's life, or that young girl's life, you're still a young girl, that young girl's life, it's going to have far-reaching things that you could have never planned. Daniel never planned on some people that had been influenced by his life many hundreds, hundreds of years before being the ones that literally discovered the Messiah. And yet, his writings did, his teachings did. You don't understand what impact your life is having on people right now. When you share with people the truth that God loves them, and has given them all that is His. You share that around the world. Some are not going to want to hear it. But many more are going to be drawn to it. Let me tell you who's drawn to that message. Hurting people. If you just influence hurting people, I'll promise you, you will have influenced a lot of folks. Well, these men, they had searched the Scriptures, and they'd seen the signs, and it's just like today. But God uses the least likely folks to deliver the message. Who would have ever thought that somebody would come from the Medes and the Persians to announce the birth of Christ? This is the first we'd heard of it. Joseph and Mary weren't going, Hey everybody, unto us is born a Savior. Unto us is given. They didn't do that. The Magi did. The Magi did. Well, I believe we're going to see things like this happening more and more. I'm going to jump down in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. 
when they, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child. Notice it doesn't say the baby Jesus. I'm going to come back to that. But why doesn't it say the baby Jesus? He wasn't a baby anymore. He's probably around two years old at this point. That's why that Herod had all the children under two killed. This wasn't. He, we see the pictures and the and the and the stable scenes where you got the three kings there kneeling by the manger. It wasn't that way. It took a while. Okay. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Now I want you to see something. Another message, one of the early messages I ever did in seminary. It's they came, they came to where the baby was. They saw. They physically saw with their eyes. But they more than saw with their eyes. They understood with their heart. And then they fell in the presence of God. They hit the floor. This wasn't a bad thing. This was a good thing. All of this was there. It's tense. It took place at a point in time. They realized it as fact. And they fell. And the Bible said, and they worshiped. You know what this word worship means? We think it means to sing and throw our hands up. It doesn't mean that. This word worship means literally to kiss the hand. That's what they were doing. They were worshiping this child. Have you ever noticed how that when little children are playing, sometimes, and our little granddaughter, Audrey, she likes to touch people. When she's sitting next to one of her cousins, if you'll notice, she's always got her hand on one of the children. But the older little children, the five-year-olds, our, our little grandson, Luke, who's five, he can be just a terror at times. But when he's around those little ones, he's so gentle, and he wants to kiss them. And even his little cousin, Audrey, who is 15 months now, or nearly 16 months, she wants to kiss her little baby brother. Little children want to kiss them. That is the form, in some ways, of worship, oriental worship. And that's what, that's what uh, was going on here. They worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. After they did all this other stuff, then they gave. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we teach people that Jesus wants us to give to Him. It's exactly the opposite. He gave to us. Do we give? Yes. Why? So He'll love us? No. So He'll think better of us? No. Why do we give? Because He is in us and we're in Him and we think like Him. We give because we have His nature. Giving is a byproduct of having the nature of Christ living in you. It's not what you do. It is who you are. But sometimes we tell people they need to give first. It's just the opposite. When people understand, I want to say this. I want to say it plain. When people understand their identity in Christ, giving is not an issue. But I'm afraid in the church today we spend so much of our time teaching on giving, not understanding that that is what we do because of who we are. It's a byproduct of walking. That's free. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. They went back a different way. Well, the Bible says they saw a star. The star had been seen in the east, and it had moved from east to west. Now, file that away. We're going to be talking about that. And it reappeared, and it led them to a specific house. We have the idea they were following the star every night. But we're going to see something maybe a little different than you ever thought. Bethlehem is about five miles from Jerusalem. Now, they were in Jerusalem talking to Herod. You know, these guys just, just assumed that everybody in Jerusalem or in Judea or in Ju would be looking for the Messiah. But nobody was. The angels now in heaven, I bet they're thinking, you know, those guys down on earth are probably really excited because Jesus is getting ready to come back. But I don't see that many excited people down here. I don't see that many, even the Christians. Well, here you are. And the star just appeared again. Now, planets normally travel from east to west across the heavens and not north to south. But could it be that the star here, which the Magi, Magi saw, which led them for a specific house or to a specific house, was not a star in the normal sense. What do we call stars? You know, they're, they're what? We see dots of what in heaven? Light. Stars are light. Could it be that this star was more than just a body in the 
in the solar system or somebody's solar system in the universe, a planet? Could it be that this star was literally the Shekinah glory of God? That same glory that led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years as a pillar of fire by day, I mean a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night? Or could it be that that light was the same light that was reflected off of Moses' face and the children of Israel saw it? By the way, that light is not reflected off your face anymore. That light radiates from you because the Shekinah glory himself lives inside of you. That is who you are. And the light that shined around the shepherds in Luke chapter 2 when they announced the coming of the Lord there in Bethlehem. You know, I, funny, I've been to the place where Jesus was born in, that, in, uh, in Bethlehem. I've been right there. And it's funny, they built a church over it. About 300 A.D., they built a church over the place where Jesus was born. But right next to this church that Constantine, the Roman emperor, built, it was really his mother-in-law or his mother that built it. But right next to that place to this day, right in downtown Bethlehem, is a field, and you'll see sheep out there to this day. It's amazing. The Shekinah glory shined down on these people, these shepherds. When Jesus was transfigured, the Bible says, His face shined or shone like the sun. You know what that is? That was God revealing His glory through His Son, Jesus. And the Bible says that with the people that met with Him, what did it talk about their clothing? It says that, that their clothing became like lights. Their garments became like lights. The Hebrew and the Greek word for star means a great radiance. In New Jerusalem where Jesus is going to rule and reign for eternity. No. This new Jerusalem is going to come down out of heaven. There is going to be no sun, S-U-N. Without sun, what don't we have today? We have no light without sun. We won't need the planet or the, or the star, the sun, because we're going to have the sun in the English, S-O-N. Jesus is our light, perpetual light in heaven, in this new Jerusalem. The Magi were not following the star. They saw the star. The Bible said they saw the star. And they knew where Jesus was going to be born. Why did they know where Jesus was going to be born? Why did they know what town? It's already written. It was already written. Andrew, you always get it. It was already written. They had studied the scriptures. They knew that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, because in Micah 5, 2, it tells us where he was going to be born. That's why they need to go to Jerusalem. That's why they need to ask the king. Well, there are evidences of Jesus' kingship. In Matthew 1, 1, it says that Jesus was, had a royal genealogy. It dates all the way back to David. On both sides, Joseph lineage goes back to David. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Joseph wasn't the real father. So, the lineage of Jesus through Joseph did not go back to King David. Ah, but Mary, her lineage also went back to King David. So, Jesus had the lineage of a king. A king. The Bible says that he was going to be born of a virgin. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, then 20 through 23, it says that he was going to be born of a virgin. We see the testimony of a priest in Matthew 2, verse 5 and 6. They knew that, that Jesus was going to be coming, these, these magi. They knew where He was going to be coming. They were looking for Him. Now today, believers are trying to get God to do what He's already done. He's already sent the Prince of Peace. He's already given peace. We're seeing people today that are trying to get people to be at peace with God. And the Bible said He's already dealt with that. We're seeing people today that are trying to get people to do something or get God to do something that He's already done. He's already sent the Son. In Matthew 2, 3, it says that He was hated by Herod. Jesus was hated by Herod. And, and, and then in Matthew 2, verses 2 and verse 11, it says that they came, they came once and for all into the house and they saw, they perceived the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and they began to worship him once they'd fallen down. And then they did something that's really amazing. 
They opened the treasures they had and they presented to him treasures, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now some believe that these gifts had a, had a big significance in reflecting the character of a child's life. Gold might represent his deity and his purity. Before Jesus was born, he was with the Father, he was in the Father, and the Father was in him, and God the Holy Spirit was in each other. They were in each other. I don't understand this, but there they were. He knew everything Jesus did because he was God. He knew everything. Now this is something I'm going to shock you with. When he was born, he was just like you. At that point, he knew nothing. At an early age, he understood who his father was, God the Father. God the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. What did he know from that point on? I'm going to tell you this. Now this, is, this gives me chill bumps. From that point on, for his 33 years, he knew what the Father revealed to him. And that's all. Now he was still fully God, but he shelved his God powers when he was born. They were put aside. I believe he took them back up again. Everything, including his knowledge and his wisdom that he had, was from God the Father. Everything. He only knew. They asked him when he was going to come back. He said, I don't know. That's for God the Father to know. I think he probably knows now. But then he didn't. Now here's the thing. All the knowledge, oh, this is going to sound big, all the wisdom that was given to Jesus, you ready? It's been given to you. Wear that one for a while. So what's the problem? We have a hard time believing what He's already done. Believe what He shows you now. And then He'll show you some new stuff. And then believe Him for that. And He'll show you some new stuff. You say, well, it's nothing new. If it's not new. It's not new to Him. But it'll be new to you. But I see Christians on this earth today that can't go beyond what they already know. And if something goes beyond what they know, it can't be of God. And I say, what? Are you telling me that God can't exist anything bigger than what you already know? God is so big. We cannot know it all in this lifetime. It's going to take all eternity for God to reveal that iceberg of Himself to us from that tiny little tip that we think we know about. Amazing. Purity. The incense. The fragrance of His life. And the myrrh. This was, this was what represents His death. It's what they would anoint the bodies with after they died. So we're talking about His pure life. His fragrant life. And His death. His death, burial, and resurrection. These were gifts that were obviously uh, given to him, to Joseph and Mary. I mean, have you ever thought, where did Joseph and Mary get the money to travel so much? They were very, very poor. Where did they get the money to travel, to go to Egypt and to live until the Holy Spirit in a dream spoke to him and said, go back to Nazareth, Herod's dead. Where did they get the money to do that? They had gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God provided for them, just like God provides for you in, in uh, Pakistan, just like God provides for people in Haiti. I have a dear friend, a dear friend in Haiti, and we were talking about this, and, and I told him, dear brother, and they have great needs there. I said, dear brother, men are not your providers. I want to look in, in your eyes, and I want to tell you that men, no matter what your situation is, they are not your providers. God is. He is. He always has been, and He always will be. Take your needs to Him. Tell Him. He already knows, but He wants you to go to Him. Sometimes He provides before we even know we have the need, but God is the provider. You say, well, He doesn't provide for everybody. I don't understand all that goes on, but I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is for everyone. God meets our needs. Sometimes we need to go home, and He takes us home. What a blessing that is. What a reward. God knows. These men, these three magi, were warned by God not to return to report to Herod. And the Bible says that they returned to their homes by another route. These men were wealthy. Some people say they were kings. They did not have to listen to anyone. They were rulers. 
And they did obey God. They, they left where they were and they went in search of the child because the child was coming. They probably lost their electricity. The child was going to be born and they knew it. And the people who knew them probably, ready for this, thought they were crazy. Just like some people think you're crazy. Because they left everything and went in search of a child. But you see, they weren't crazy at all. They were crazy like a fox. They knew what was real, and they knew what mattered. This Jesus that was born of a virgin, laid in a manger, lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, was buried and was raised, and as a result of His death, burial, and resurrection, has given all that was His to you. He is still alive, and He still loves you, and He's still calling you to Himself. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. Jesus loves you, and He's given all that was His to you. Will you simply believe and receive what He's already given you as yours during this Christmas season and after the Christmas season?